Okay, I'd like to uh, call the uh, June meeting of the Historic Preservation Commission to order. And I forgot. Would you call the roll, please? Commissioner Brown. Present. Commissioner Crank Clements. Commissioner Broadbent. Present. Commissioner Fudge. Commissioner Massey. Commissioner Meacham. Present. Commissioner Ryman Phillip. Present. Commissioner Schultz. Present. Commissioner Zakritz. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. Barely. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to go over the uh, uh, procedure for the meeting. It's on the back of the front page of the agenda. The chairman will announce each case and ask interested parties to indicate their presence by raising their hand. Commissioners will discuss details of the case, calling on staff for details. Following this discussion, commissioners may choose to ask questions of parties present. Interested persons may speak to support or protest the application. The applicant will be entitled to one brief rebuttal. Interaction between applicant and protestants on the floor is not permitted. Persons speaking are asked to approach the center podium one at a time to introduce themselves by name and address and sign in, please, and to present their position as succinctly as possible. <clears throat> the commission asks each speaker to limit his or her remarks to no more than five minutes. Following the public hearing on an application, the commission will take one of the following actions. One, approve the certificate of appropriateness. Two, continue the proposal. Three, deny the proposal with prejudice, which means the application may not be resubmitted for at least one year unless the commission determines that circumstances have changed. Or four, deny the proposal without prejudice, which means the applicant may reapply at any time. When an application has been approved and after a 10-day protest period has expired, the historic preservation officer will mail the CA to the applicant. City construction permits cannot be issued until the CA has been issued. Contact HP staff for final design review inspection or to withdraw items that will not be completed. And finally, any person aggrieved by any decision granting or denying a CA <clears throat> may appeal to the Oklahoma City Board of Adjustment. All appeals shall be made within 10 days of the commission decision by filing a written notice of appeal with the clerk of the BOA. Okay. Uh, with that, let's go to two from the Office of the Historic Preservation Officer. Katie? I have nothing to report. Well. That's all. Okay. Uh, code enforcement report. Uh, oh, where's minutes? Oh, three, acceptance of the minutes of the previous meetings. Are there any comments or questions on the minutes or motion? I'll move approval of the minutes. I'll second. Okay, moved by Suzanne Broadband and seconded by Klaus Ryman Phillip, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, the minutes are accepted. Uh, now on to the uh, code enforcement report. Anybody from the city here would like to comment or questions um, on that? I thought we were going to have an inspector. I don't see so him. Too. Um, we uh, just, as always, the, um, you can find more information about all of these through the Action Center. Um, you can go on the city's website um, where it says report it and click, click on check status and search for these um, by address. Uh, if there is an actual citation number, then you can use that to look up additional information about where it is in the code enforcement process. And you can always call us or call um, code enforcement staff with, uh, or call Action Center at their phone number for more information. Okay, thank you. All right, so then on to continuance announcements and requests. Looks like none. We did not have any uh, new requests for continuances either. Okay. Uh, public hearings, dilapidated structures. C-19-18-222, and that is the code enforcement case number, just so you know it's not an actual certificate of appropriateness. At 2100 Northwest 27th Street, Shepherd Ward 2, regarding dwelling and garage, receive Historic Preservation Commission comments regarding structures in the process of being declared dilapidated as initiated by the City of Oklahoma City Development Services Code Enforcement pertaining to uh, properties that contribute to the historic integrity of the historic district, and two, the effect of proposed demolition of structures on the historic character of the property and district. Uh, as always, um, 
when we are reviewing a property that is in the process of being declared dilapidated. This is something that goes to city council for a vote, um, and it is a, uh, it's something that they evaluate as a public health and safety concern. So we are not granting a certificate of appropriateness for the demolition. We are only weighing in on what impact the demolition has on the historic character of the property and the district and whether the loss of the structures would adversely affect the character of the property and district. Okay. Could, yeah, could you clarify the difference between when you condemn a building and you know, specified as being unsafe to occupy versus uh, dilapidated? You know, what are the different, you know, what's the different jargon there? I was, Rita might know that better than I do, but I know that properties can be declared abandoned, they can be declared unsecured, and they can be declared dilapidated. And I think it has to do with different levels of structural um, disrepair and condition. Um, it can be unsecured when it is otherwise in perfectly fine condition, but maybe a window is broken or the door no longer functions um, or the door is gone. Uh, whereas dilapidated looks at more elements of the condition of the building. Maybe there are holes in the roof, holes in the siding, failing foundation, things like that. And the health department would be more likely to, to condemn a property because of unhealthful conditions on the property. Uh, but the city declares a, a property dilapidated, as Katie said, or unsecured. And then if it's declared unsecured or dilapidated, it is also considered for abandoned building status. So if they decide, if the city council says this property is dilapidated, they are not condemning it. That's a health department. Okay. Katie, I, this is my old neighborhood, so I lived right around the corner from this for 12 years. And it's been like this for quite some time, but never been for sale it's just that there a uh, lot of houses so left. it's not that I don't think that that it could not be saved it's a brick house and a small small brick house and it's at the entrance of the historic district I can't remember um, a, I can, we've had plenty of garages before us for the city to declare dilapidated and I can understand this one this one has been it became kind of a, say, a destination for, uh, you know, people to break into and stay. And, I mean, it's just been a continuous uh, kind of cycle that way. But uh, I have concerns that we would, about city council, I mean, what, what, what else can be done, if anything? I mean, it seems like a big step for a house in a historic district that has never been for sale to, mm -hmm. to be in a situation where it could be torn down. Several years ago, we had, I think, at least three houses that went through the commission right in kind of a group of over a couple of months. Um, one that was in Crown Heights, one that was in Heritage Hills, another that was in, I think, maybe Jefferson Park. Um, and all of those have since been um, rehabbed to some extent. Um, one. I know at least one sold, I think, at, at sheriff sale. Uh, one of the properties, I believe, the dilapidated process motivated the owners who were, um, who no longer lived there and had, I think, the best of intentions to rehab the property but just hadn't done it, hadn't had the resources to do it. They finally said, okay, we'll sell it. Um, someone reached out to that, you know, was able to contact that owner and, and convince them to sell the property. Um, so sometimes I think this is a tool not necessarily to tear it down, but to motivate an owner to take some sort of action, whether it's repairing the property or um, going ahead and, and selling it. But unfortunately, there are a lot of barriers to the city. We can't just take it away from somebody. Um, and we also have limitations on the amount of work that city staff can go in and do. You know, it would be great if we could just send our own crew out and say, we'll fix it up and, <laughs> you know, make all the repairs. But Okay, well, in this situation, maybe it will work because, um, I mean, it certainly, ha I, think, I think it still has value. Yeah. And, well, and I would just say been some kind of weird, you know, I know things, sometimes it's just a very unusual situation where, for whatever reason, I mean, this has been going on, I think, since, I'm going to say 15 years. Mm -hmm. I think in several, if not all of those cases, um, council heard 
quite a bit from the neighborhood and from surrounding neighbors that said, you know, there are people who will be willing to fix this. We want to work with you. We want to make this make this right. So that's another um, kind of suggestion, I guess. Okay. Uh, is there a, any more comments or a motion or recommendation? Uh, I'll move to um, make the following recommendations to City Council, uh, as noted in the staff report, but I'll read them for the record. Uh, the primary structure has been altered but retains a sufficient degree of historic fabric to be feasibly rehabilitated and to contribute to the historic integrity of the district. Uh, demolition of the primary structure will have an adverse effect on the historic character of the district. The accessory structure has been altered and expanded but may retain a significant um, or sufficient degree of historic fabric to be rehabilitated and to contribute to the historic integrity of the district. And the demolition of the accessory structure in its current altered condition may not have an adverse effect on the historic character of the district. Okay. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Klaus, Robin, Phillip, and seconded by Suzanne Broadbent. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that's sent on to the City Council. On to the uh, consent docket, is that next? Yes, no, uh, nothing under National Register. Oh, National Register, sorry. Nothing. Uh, All right, consent docket. Under consent docket, we have, so because we are right at a quorum today, we have some unusual conditions, and we'll do some little song and Juggling. dance up here to <laughs> accommodate everyone. Um, the first item is technically our chair's application, even though he didn't know it was on the agenda because it's, <laughs> It was approved several months ago. They're just making a small change. But because of that, um, we need to pull that item from the consent docket so that we can have a quorum vote on the remaining items. And we have another commission member who is able to attend. He should be here around 3 o'clock this afternoon. He was not able to be here when we started the meeting. Um, but uh, when, we have, when we are able to have a quorum without Alan, then we will hear or other that item. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, that one, right? Yeah. yeah. So. All right, so on that note, I, will, uh, I would like to make a motion to pull item one from an HBCA 18-00183 from the consent docket and move it to uh, cases for individual consideration. Okay. Is there a second? Second. To move by Klaus Raman Phillips and seconded by Suzanne Broadbent. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Item one is moved to individual consideration. So now, anything else on the consent docket or motion to approve it? <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve the uh, consent docket. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> moved by Klaus Roman Phillips again and seconded by Suzanne Broadman again. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, consent docket is approved. On to D, cases for individual consideration, and that item one would become the first one, but we're going to defer that until the uh, commissioner arrives and go on to uh, D1. So if, if you were on the consent docket and you were items two, three, or four, um, HPCA 19-13, 19-21, 19-75, all three of those cases have been approved. You don't need to stay unless you would just like to. Um, <laughs> you will get your certificate of appropriateness in the mail. You can contact staff if you have any additional questions about those items. Um, for 18-183, we'll hear that as soon as we have a quorum to take action on it. Um, so, okay, individual consideration. HPCA 19-29 at 600 Northwest 17th Street, Mesta Park, Ward 6. Consideration and possible action on application by Pat Salami for certificate of appropriateness to one, replace retaining wall required, and two, replace yard steps required. Okay, is the applicant present? Applicant's not present. Okay, uh, any comments on this? The commissioners. I can just briefly summarize this work was already completed, um, as you'll see in the staff report. Um, they replaced a um, stone retaining wall um, pretty much in kind. They reused the stones from the wall uh, to just rebuild it. I think there was some misunderstanding about at what point that was no longer considered ordinary maintenance and repair. But the one item 
and the, mm -hmm. that we did split out as a separate um, application item is that they replaced the concrete steps and changed the walls to the side of the stairs um, significantly. It's not the same as what was there previously, so we did call that out for separate consideration. With the applicant not present, um, Continue. We, could, we can approve it, obviously, but if you have additional questions or would want to ask them to consider making revisions, uh, we probably want to just continue it. I would just make a comment. I don't know if we do continue it um, so that they have some feedback maybe for making changes. But I mean, the, the wall itself looks nice. I think they did a good job with it. The only thing I, I think is a little bit off maybe is uh, kind of the transition between the wall to the, you know, to the wall that turns in with the stairs. Kind of, I understand if there's an elevation change or if it needs to be a different height, but um, maybe there's a way to make that transition smoother or nicer. That would be my only. Well, I think they were, on the original stairs, the stairs kept going, but there was no sidewall. I think they were trying to, they just adjusted the height of that to meet the top step. Mm-hmm. I mean, see what I'm, mm -hmm. so. And I don't know, I mean, I don't know if it's even. I feel like it's very close. Yeah. I mean, it's. But what about those side walls? Well, that's what, the side walls are higher because the, sta the original sides of the, the top three stairs were concrete on the side. Oh, yeah, yeah. But and so they just did that to. I mean, but they replaced the original. What'd you call those? He had a name for them. Um, apparently, they are called cheek walls. Cheek, cheek walls. walls. Right, the inside. You learn something every day. Um, with these stone walls. Oh, the, you mean the, are you, are you referring to the, the curb? The, the basically, curb. it looks like yeah. a curb along the side of the stairs. Yeah, that seems pretty significant to me that the cheek walls were, you know, really a, uh, to me, an important part of the of the presentation, and I'm sure I feel they were historic. So I I think there's been quite a bit of change. Plus, the concrete is not uh, colored the way that it should be. So, would you like to move to continue this? Well, I'm not in favor of approving it at this point. So or deny it. So I don't know. Staff's recommending continue it for more information on what they can provide. Here's what it is. <laughs> well, I will move to continue um, HPCA 19-000029 to the July 5th meeting. Is that our date, July? It is, I would say, based on just timing of getting back with the applicant and with the holiday coming up, it's the July 3rd meeting. So I would say let's do August 7th. Okay, to the August 7th meeting. It's not going to hold them up. They already did it, so. Right. <laughs> okay, is there a second? I'll second that. We're moved by Suzanne Broadbent and seconded by Linda Schultz. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, item is continued. Next. HPCA 19-33 at 525 Northwest 42nd Street, Crown Heights, Ward 2. Consideration and possible action on application by Brandon Swearingen for certificate of appropriateness to one, construct addition elective, two, reconstruct chimney with substitute materials elective, and three, convert garage door opening to two car width, single door with lighting elective. Okay, is the applicant present? Okay. Um, the commission saw this uh, previously. And we do have a revised design for the addition. Um, we've called out the replacement of the chimney as a separate item so that potentially the addition could be approved, even if the commission um, wants to continue the chimney for further consideration or has additional questions on that. They're two separate items, so we can act on them separately. Um, the applicant did provide us with a sample of the proposed chimney material, so I'll pass that around and otherwise let you explain what all has changed. Very good. 
I also provided some pictures of previous constructed chimneys. I don't know if we have that as well. Yes. Okay. The image of the, the chimney that they created so, in the package. I mean, it has the it has the detail all the way down to the mortar of the brick. So drive it. Um, on on the ones that have previously been constructed. It'll essentially sit on there just like that. It'll be step flashed into the roof and um, in the attic space, we are going to do five eighths um, metal, which will have lag bolts going into it to secure it to the home uh, permanently. And then the step flashing will look a lot better than that, but it'll be tied into the shingles via step flashing. <clears throat> Joe, did you see the sample? Ah, I did. Okay. Is that a is this epoxy coating? Is it like drive it? Or? Uh, very similar. It's actually more um, like compared to a truck bed liner on the outside coating there. Um, and then it'll have a fine layer of stucco over that with the brick detail and everything. Is that described in here anymore? <clears throat> You have a brochure um, on the product and some oh. kind of technical sheets on the Correct. product in your packet. Taylor Foam? Taylor Foam would be the manufacturer of the. Okay. <clears throat> and they've done projects all around the all around the city doing pretty much the same application. It's like they specialize in just anything in foam. I mean interior, exterior. Well, it's unfortunate. Uh, let's see. Any, any comments on that? I'm trying to. Do you have, is the existing floor plan in here? Should be, yes, sir. It's a renovated first floor plan, renovated second floor plan. I'm kind of struggling with this one because I can see it kind of going two ways. Either you keep the real chimney or you get rid of it. I don't know if I love the idea of replacing it with a, you know, essentially a fake chimney. Um, I, don't see, I don't see the existing plan. <clears throat> it's like on the, the existing is on the same page as the proposed. If you cut oh. out the, okay. um, like an 11 by 17. Folds. It's um, page right there. Okay. Yep. Twelve of thirty. Doesn't show where the chimney. Comes. So the next, if you look at, um, it says existing attic and then renovated second floor plan. I think the chimney is what roughly where the stairway turns on the Correct. second floor. Correct. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Right on the landing of the converted attic. And then, again, to touch on, I know it's been a while, but the integrity of the chimney that's there, I mean, we couldn't save it. It's either tear it down and rebuild it or um, do the proposed chimney. And, you know, from the, from the street, from the road, it would appear to be the original chimney. We would just um, open up the space below it. But to salvage the existing chimney there is, is not an option in this case. It's, it's, it's failing at the foundation. So uh, is it is it brick all the way up? But you're saying it's kind of falling apart. That is correct. At the bottom there, you know, I mean, it's pretty pretty common actually. It's 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 being supported as we speak with OSB and two by four um, interior wise, just to make sure it doesn't collapse. But is that because you've taken part of the chimney out it, of it the was, interior? It was like that when we bought the home. Um, it was in bad shape when we bought the home from the lady who lived in there. It was, um, and her brother, you know, Brandon Claves could testify to that. It, it, it's been supported for a while. Um, now, we have braced it more, there's no doubt about it, during construction just to make sure that there was no, um, you know, safety hazards in the home. But um, it's been leaking and, support, you know, been, been supported for quite a while now. Um, it's very bad shape in the interior of it. As far as the integrity of the um, of the fireplace itself, so not, so you haven't removed any of the interior. I have not removed anything as of yet. You know, <laughs> no, no ma'am, it's still there. So how much of the chimney was removed? 
from the roof down? Or you said supported right now. Correct. It's It's been supported just because we've done so much other construction around it, but the actual chimney has not been touched. It's Oh, it hasn't? Okay. It's, it's maintained its integrity, although it's... Um, so it's all there from correct, yes, sir. to top? Hmm. With settling at the bottom and a few bricks missing in the foundation. Hmm. I kind of feel, from an architectural standpoint, um, you know, if it was a chimney that was in the back of the house or not really that visible, you know, maybe there are other chimneys, it wouldn't be as big a deal. But, you know, I think sometimes from an architectural standpoint, there's an opportunity to, um, you know, if you have a feature like that, somehow highlight that, especially in a historic house like this. So if you have this chimney, I mean, I understand it needs some work. Uh, but I think there's a way, you know, that you could, and I know that we really don't touch on interior things here anyway. We, we generally talk about the exterior improvements. But it seems like it seems like there'd be an opportunity to you know take that chimney and highlight it you know maybe you know if you have to tuck point or uh, you know replace some bricks or whatever um, and maybe make that a you know center point of a living room or you know I I feel like there might be some options there to save it you know I, I feel like if it if it's like you know if it, for whatever reason if I had to come down I I have a hard time replacing it with a foam chimney also I don't know if that's the best solution. I, I guess I would I'd have to kind of disagree because I think that I really I think the applicant has tried and I've looked at the floor plans I can see where they're coming from it's in bad condition I, I think his proposal and we talked about kind of moving it leaving him to kind of believe I think before that that was a possibility I mean I, I think it's the best intention I don't we, we we approve a lot of projects where we do exceptions, and we have lots of chimneys. I just feel like that this one, um, for the floor plan and what they're trying to do, they've gone back, they've changed the plans. The, our biggest concern last time was also the roof line. They've lowered the roof line so you can't see that from the front. So it would just be my opinion that either let them take it off or go with, I think they've made a, a very big effort to find some a way to replace it and it's going to be moved it's going to be in the same location really and look just like that that would be my my comment I am I think the guidelines are pretty clear though for me on the kinds of materials that are historically appropriate for for these kinds of projects and I just don't I couldn't do, I, I couldn't be in favor of the foam. I would almost, uh, it would be I would stuck almost lean to not have it if, you're, if it's going to be foam. I mean, the materials uh, really need to be more historically appropriate, in my opinion. Yes, that's fine. I wanted to remind the commission, just last month we denied a request to remove a chimney on a building that was being renovated. Um, the chimney was in the way of their interior floor plan, um, and they, the applicant, um, said, "Okay, we will we will figure out how to work around it. We will come up with a structural support so that the chimney remains from the roof line up, but doesn't disrupt our floor plan on the interior." I've done a little asking around with I'm on a listserv with other historic commission staff. Um, it's the nerdiest listserv you can be on, um, but. Quite a few people chimed in, oh, yes, we approve that sort of thing all the time. People come back in and they frame it up in the roof and support it. And um, uh, I know that's going to be more, that would be more complicated. And obviously, a masonry chimney is heavier than foam. But I, I feel like this is a big step to say it's OK to replace a historic chimney with an alternate material just because you're remodeling the inside of the house. So not to say that the commission can't approve it, but I think we need to be very careful about thinking through why and when and how that is appropriate. And that, as a matter of fact, I, I mean, I, I, I was kind of uh, conflicted myself about our approach to chimneys uh, most recently and went back and it, it has been fairly consistent that the commission has required that chimneys not be destroyed or, or any other materials used. I mean, it's sort of been consistent for a number of years that we keep them. Um, 
I, I think on this one too, it's a little different because in a lot of the ones where we've had people actually build a structure to hold up the original chimney, they've had an attic to do that. So this is kind of an exception to that rule and they're actually building the, they're renovating the attic and so they don't have that opportunity to build that platform to hold up the. Is, a, is the attic space, the new attic, is it vaulted? Correct, yes, going all the way up. <clears throat> to get the eight foot ceiling height. That? To get the eight foot ceiling height that we would need um, to go all the way to the peak. Because all the way to the peak? Correct. There's no flat area? Correct, no. Okay. Not in this particular area, no, sir. Okay. No, outside of, you know, going up on the roof and cutting it out, you would have no knowledge that it's not brick. I mean, um, the samples that we provided, I mean, outside of having them make it and me bringing it up here, there's going to be no, you know, final product that I can present. But I have presented, you know, prior projects completed by Taylor Foam. And, um, you know, it, it'll be an exact replica of the uh, fireplace outside of the materials. I understand that, um, you know, keeping it, supporting it, you know, has been an option in the past. Um, in this particular case, you know, for structural support of the, of the chimney, um, I just don't think that's be possible. If it, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing it in this um, circumstance. There's no, there's no supporting way so we can carry the load all the way to a supporting wall or an, an LV. In this particular, it's, um, I just, I don't think that option would be possible in this, in this, in this case. You know, this home was a thousand square foot home. We're bringing it to a 2,500 square foot house to have, you know, a chimney nine foot into the entrance, the entrance of the home. It, you know, it's, um, it would serve my remodel pretty meaningless of an open concept that, you know, most buyers nowadays. I'm just trying to think of what unique circumstance here. <laughs> You know, compared to last month, it's it's a smaller house, not much floor space, which makes the every square foot more important. Um, you are building out the entire attic, so there's no leftover attic to hide structure. That's another possible. I mean, you can't just approve it because we. Uh, I wouldn't like personally like to see a fake fireplace either. Would not. So to me, it's either keep it or remove it. That's my opinion. So I was trying to figure out. That's kind of where I'm at. I, I think if it's not feasible to keep it for whatever, you know, whatever it's structural reasons, then I think it'd be better not to have them have the foam one. But at the same time, I mean, we had this discussion last time, and I, I'm, I'm kind of not convinced that you can't shore it up enough to support it. I mean, you're putting in a new staircase here. You know, so you've, you've had to put some extra structure in to support that stairway, to um, have that open. I mean, leaving. the whole second floor is not going to be occupied, so you've had to shore up the whole second floor. So to me, I mean, you can get some gator joists, you can get some, you know, you can get some LVLs or something. I, you said that's leave, not, leave the fireplace? Chimney? I mean, potentially, I, I just don't. I mean, so for example, on the second floor, uh, you've got that eight-foot ceiling height line. But you're saying that's just kind of showing you where that line is. It's not actually going to be flat there. Is that correct? Or? That is correct. Yes, sir. It's just a clearance line. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, if you, if you uh, let's say you did put in a ceiling there at that eight foot, you know, so you have eight foot ceiling. Or higher. Or higher, even at nine foot, whatever. Yeah. I think, you know, if you. A platform or something? Or something? Yeah, something. I mean, so if you look at. Just leave the upper portion of the fireplace. Yeah, just like leave creating, what you can see above the roof frame, and creating some framing yeah. across there. That's what I was kind of thinking too. And that little, it's not that tall. Uh, I don't think it'd be that much weight. And that, the just fireplace the, is right top. in the middle of that roof, you know, or right the, um, yeah. on that roof ridge. So it looks like it'd be about, you know, this portion of the house is about 12 feet, 10 inches wide. So that, you know, that's about, I mean, that looks like it's right around where those stairs would be. So if you're going to, beef up the framing for the stairs anyway. And you've got, you know, you've got all kinds of walls on the second floor that could kind of bear that. You got the shower right there, you got I feel like you could probably take the weight of that 
fireplace and have it bear on some kind of LVL or some kind of... Yeah. Well, I mean, all the framing to support the staircase is on the bottom floor. It has nothing to do with above that. Um, I, think well, I mean, you had to put an opening in for the stairs to come up into the second floor, right? Yes, there, there is definitely an opening there. Yeah. Um, so you probably have to add some extra framing but no LVs. frame out that could, opening, right? Could, oh. Yes, you, two by eights would be required there, but no LVs, which are, in this case, to carry that load, I mean, I would probably think there are 16-inch LVs at, at minimum. I mean, um, that's a pretty, yeah, it's a small fireplace, I get that, but I mean, that's a has a top cap, a bottom cap with bricks filling, uh, two layers of bricks in between that. It's it's pretty substantial in the weight of it, I can I don't, I don't know the exact weight of that, but. Um, well, that brings up a question. So the chimney's there. The fire, is that a new fireplace on the uh, west? Proposed, yes. That's a, that's a ventless type. It's a ventless from the open space. So in the, the interior. existing fireplace itself you're taking out? Um, well, there, yes. Is there one now? Yes, there is, and, but it's, um, you know, it's. There's so, no mantle there. There's no anything. There's a, I mean, it just the original insert is kind of what's in there right now. Yeah, so the chimney would go down to nothing, basically. Uh, okay, here's kind of a, I mean, this is totally different. I'm not to design the project, and I don't know how the commission feels about this, but if they turn the new chimney on the exterior of the wall there into a brick chimney that went up, so you had, you know, kind of a, the profile of the a chimney, I think that's maybe even more consistent what you see historically than having kind of the one in the middle of the roof anyways. I, I, I will say on this or? block, there are quite a few houses in a row that have this exact chimney really? in the middle really? of the house. This is a pretty <laughs> uniform block hmm. um, with a bunch that are the same footprint that have this, I think, I'm not sure if there's a picture in the PowerPoint that shows that, but we looked kind of on a street view. I was going to ask the commission, it sounds like, no matter what, even if you were going to keep the chimney, it would have to essentially be rebuilt because of the condition. If perhaps a chimney, you know, a, a faux chimney that's a, maybe a brick veneer, like a thin brick veneer instead of the foam, would give some of the people who aren't real comfortable with the foam a little bit more comfort. Mm. Um, the other comment I wanted to make was to be cautious about how we use the word feasible, because when we talk about things not being feasible, we usually mean it's structurally not possible, something is structurally dilapidated and failing, or it's not feasible because of building code. Um, this, is a, this is a renovation to a house. This is an addition to a house. Um, and it might not work for their numbers of what they want to spend and what they want to get out economic of it. Feasibility. But it's, it's yeah. physically, structurally feasible to do nothing, um, or to replace the chimney or keep the chimney kind. So I just want to. As I said, I think this is something that we haven't reviewed before, using a substitute material to replace a, a masonry chimney, so I want to be thoughtful in how we outline why that is or is not appropriate. You say we have approved something? No. Oh, have not. No. Okay. Yeah. That's why to me, I mean, I'm not a structural engineer, but I've been involved in a lot of construction. To me, you know, I think it, I think it would be feasible. It's just a matter of, you know, how much time and effort, you know, what kind of structure you, you have to put in. I mean, I recognize you want to do an open floor plan, but to me, I think, I think there are creative ways to where you could even integrate the existing bottom portion into a floor plan that would, you know, kind of meet modern living needs, you know. I could, um, well, you, I could you see. You have an architect. Yes. What, have you all, what, what's been the discussion? As far as um, plan B's, if Just, we right. weren't able to to tear it down and I mean because we can't keep it in its current condition but we can reuse the brick and you know build it um, in, the, in the current spot but to tell you the truth we haven't touched much on it yet um, and I'm half full kind of guy so I was really hoping to get this approved hoping that somebody wouldn't climb up on the roof and what, what are the dimensions of a chimney <clears throat> like six by just... four um, six by three and a half I think to be Six, six foot east to west, and I think it's 18 inches overhanging on the ridge both sides, but it, it should be on there specified. But, but very, very close to that within six inches. It looks square. What's that? The chimney looks square to me. I, I don't, I sure don't think so. 
It looks the same from the east and the west, and then the north and south. This, the street runs east and west there. Well, I know. If you look at your east elevation, means, but it looks I just, the I don't, same. I don't think in this. See, it's it's a lot less deep than it is wide. Okay, so it's um, just, so it's about six by three and a half. So it's just not drawn accurately. <clears throat> six by three and a half, six feet wide, three and a half feet deep. Is that right? Yes, sir. It's hmm. an interesting. Well, I think, you know, if, I think having a proposal like Katie mentioned where maybe instead of using the foam, you frame it up out of wood and then use, you know, like a brick veneer, maybe even a thinner brick, you know, if you cut them in half or something. I mean, you'd have the same materiality, you know, the same texture. I mean, it's literally the same materials, just not as heavy, you know. I mean, I think that would be my preferred solution. It seems like... I mean, I understand, and, and, you know, you bought the house in the condition it's in, so, you know, uh, um, I'm sure that, you know, I don't believe you did anything to, you know, tear it down, or, you know, I'm sure you even shorted it up to keep it from falling down, so. I just really dislike the idea of having some kind of alternate material. I mean, I just imagine, like, after a hailstorm or two, you know, I, I just can't imagine it aging well. Well, I, so. I personally can't see a fake chimney of any type, but. Of any type? Yep. My well, myself. It's either, to me, it's keep it or approve. Uh, taking it off. That's my opinion. And the chimney doesn't go anywhere right now. The, ch the fireplace downstairs is gone. Uh, so I thought the fireplace wasn't gone. No, it's gone. It will I mean, be gone. It's, it's, it's still there, sir, but I mean, there's no mantle. Um, the bricks on the inside of it where the insert goes, Probably 50% of those are missing. So it's, I mean, it's still there, but the integrity of its current condition. It's not a functional very, fireplace. It's not a functional fireplace. Your plan is to well, there's correct. probably been fireplaces like that before. That well, they're putting in a new fireplace uh, in a different location. Well, but, but I, I mean, I'm, to Katie's point, the, in, the interior design should really accommodate the historic requirements as opposed to us accommodating. Yeah. Interior design, that's really not what we're supposed to do. So, true. And I can't think of a unique circumstance where I would say, you know, that would justify demolishing. I mean, it's really just an inconvenience at that point. And this is pretty high profile, no pun intended, but uh, with so many on that street having the same kind of mm. kind of chimney. And then it is such a yeah, striking feature of the yeah, house that one. whatever we do with it. That photograph shows the next house of the same. Yeah, yeah. So whatever we do with it is kind of going to be setting a precedent for um, these kinds of future requests. And since it's all in the design stage, essentially, I, I agree with, with uh, Commissioner Schultz's point that design needs to accommodate historic preservation. Hmm. Okay. Well, so I guess we could shift gears real quick and look at, there are two other items, the uh, garage and the addition. So you definitely, I think, address our comments on addition with the uh, roof pitch. Okay. I think last time that was the request that we made, was to lower the top of the roof on the addition to be even or below the right. existing. And what, what's been submitted is, is in compliance with that suggestion. Yes, they did that and um, I think reduced the width of it a little bit to kind of address some of the concerns about the proportion of that back addition. Um, there were some comments about it being really wide. I think there's some changes to windows and things. Um, staff felt like all of those changes kind of brought it into compliance with everything the commission asked for the last time. Yep. I think we have had one drawing, the renovated north elevation, the drawing of the window doesn't match the window submitted, but we had just said for that to be a condition, Correct. the approval if, it, if approved. 
so that we get that drawing corrected. Let's say anything you know in the garage except the existing site plan. You see the overhead door cut sheet. Um, am I missing it? Or, or a new side plan. I, I think you want to take out the, uh, you want to put a wide garage door in the, in the front. Yes, sir. Take it from a single to a double. Uh, Won't that require also revising the driveway? I don't, I don't, I don't believe so. Oh, it's, it's different than your side plan. Okay. <laughs> the side plan shows. Kevin uh, has been fired since um, this project, I can assure okay. you. Okay. The side plan shows a single uh, width driveway. Okay. It, it does feather out there after the after the house. Yeah. Or it shows that uh, grass indicator on the concrete. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Um, I don't see an elevation of the garage in your packet, and we may not have asked for one because it was pretty simple. You've got a photo of the front elevation of the garage on page eight of thirty, and it would just be removing that pedestrian door and creating a two Oh, there's, a, there's your site plan on page nine. Yeah, I see garage it. Garage door opening. Yep, I see it. Sorry. Right. I missed that uh, sketch, too. So on the existing site plan, it is accurate how the driveway is. Yep. Sorry, Mika. Well, there was another one on page yeah, uh, 11 that. That's yeah. I, that I saw that first. <laughs> and we can administratively approve any changes that need to happen to the driveway, if there even are any. You might yeah. need them. Okay. Well, I would make a motion to approve for HPCA 19-0003 items 1 and 2 with the specific findings and conditions as noted by the staff in the staff report. I'm sorry, do you two, mean items one, one and two? And, or one and I'm sorry, what did I say? Three was, and, two is the chimney. I thought I said one and three, I'm sorry. One and three, okay. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Joe Meacham and seconded by Klaus, Ron, and Philip. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, one and three are approved. And now the best relay. Well, in this case, we could continue. Doesn't <laughs> if that's, we that's fine. I mean, we can definitely continue. And if using brick, um, one layer of brick instead of the three layers of brick that's up there, going all the way to the the clay flue, um, you know, that's that's fine. And, you know, we can explore that option if you, mean a thin brick? If you think there's a better um, you know chance of approval. Um, higher rate a thin, the on. thin brick. Yes, sir. Uh, so we'd frame it like you know when we're framing the addition and then um, sheath it with matching brick, same profile, same width, top cap, so on and so forth. Still seems fake to me, but I think from a distance you wouldn't tell the difference between that and the foam. Yeah, exactly. But so I would. Would you like? I'm not. I'm going to still be. In saving the chimney, just I just wanted you to know that going forward, so that your planning could include that thought. And I kind of I kind of second that too. You know, I've, you know, short of just getting rid of it completely, which I don't think makes sense uh, given the kind of the neighboring character. I think whether you replace it with foam, whether you replace it with you know like a brick veneer, I mean that that just doesn't make sense. I mean. Yeah. There's not a, there's not a uh, kind of a unique circumstance that I can think of, and it's really just an inconvenience. I, I think there's a way that, I mean, I think an architect could be creative in how they either use existing one or, you know, do the structural engineer and find a way to shore it up somehow. So. Well, I think the applicant was saying if they rebuilt it with brick, 
but with just one layer of brick around the exterior instead of three, which mm -hmm. would reduce the weight. I mean, we oh, not the thin we, brick. You know, staff, the commission don't look at the structural elements of things, and people rebuild things all the time and do it You're differently saying, from yeah, using to use a, still full using a, a full brick. Yes, a full brick. Just I one, thought you were talking just about one thin. layer of it. I just one layer of it would, it would um, you know, take the layers of, of brick down, but the width of the brick used would be the same. So just half the just one weight of it, of it, basically. So that, I'm sorry. Regular, like half the weight of it, basically. Correct. You have, so correct. regular yeah. modular brick, full depth, with just one layer. Correct. Like well, probably. That'd be at least uh, you wouldn't have to worry about the veneer falling off or something. Yeah, it's like the thick brick, stick on brick. Would right. Be. Would. <laughs> Uh, okay. Could we approve it with reconstruct the chimney uh, with um, identical materials on the exterior? Okay. I think so. Is that what you're proposing? Absolutely. Yes, that way you can just get on with it. Sounds like everybody's nodding their heads, or it looks like it. So, we'll make a motion. Okay. I would make a motion for HPCA 19-00033, item 2. to reconstruct the chimney using identical materials on the exterior to be painted as is now. Okay, this is the one where we have the um, If you all know, we have the addendum to the Recommendation we had for some cut and paste errors. Yes, on that. <laughs> I know. I saw that. Um, okay, with the specific findings that for uh, that the chimney is a character defining feature, that right. this specific chimney is historic, um, that I'm going to change item three that it appears to be feasible to replicate the exterior of the chimney with identical materials. Um, Could I suggest rebuild instead of replicate? Okay, rebuild the chimney with identical materials on the exterior, and that's the three I'm going to choose. Okay. Is there a second? Would there be a condition that it's that that, uh, that, that be Submitted to staff okay. prior to it being built, or okay, um, with for the condition that a um, say construction drawing be prepared by your architect to be submitted to the planning to the to staff to be included as part of the application. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Moved by Joe Meacham and seconded by Klaus Ryman Phillip. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Been approved. Thank you very much. Right. Found a that. middle ground. Good. I like that. All right. Now well, we've got our, our yes. uh, additional commissioners, so we can go back to C1. So we have one item that was actually on the consent docket that we'll vote on really quickly because Alan has to recuse. Okay. And um, we don't usually have quite this musical chairs of who's recusing and not it's no, not yet. We haven't got there yet. Klaus, would you take over the meeting? HPCA 18-00183, Revision 1 at 837 Northwest 38th Street, Edgemere Park Ward 2, consideration of possible action on application by Alan Brown for Matt Cannon for certificate of appropriateness for a revision to number 6, revised approved ad addition to include smart side uh, siding material elective. This is a project that was already approved with a different siding material and they wanted to submit, switch to a different product. It's a product that is not identified in the guidelines as allowed for new construction and additions, um, but is also not called out as prohibited. And we have been approving it on a fairly regular basis um, for uh, just on a case-by-case -case basis when people I, apply for it. I thought we were only 
You were only approving it on garages. We've approved it on, on several editions, I think, at this point. It's, it has a smooth finish that, um, and it actually has, appears to have a wider variety of profiles available than fiber cement that um, I guess match I thought we talked about this on another project where we said if wood was available, why would not you use wood? I don't really. Well, it's an addition. The guidelines allow for fiber cement. Right, on. but I thought that when we had discussed smart siding in the past that we were, I don't know, that we had kind of limited it to garages. Well, I wasn't here, but I would agree with Commissioner Misham on where, how we use it and how we uh, approve its use. Okay. Well, I know that we've, I know we've approved it on several editions um, and on full-fledged new construction projects, I believe for houses and garages. Um, we have said when it's the historic house itself and the historic garage itself that you have to stick with wood. Um, but I think several times now the commission has felt that this product was comparable to fiber cement, which the guidelines state is allowed. I agree it is, but I just still don't understand on something small like this why we would, why somebody would need to go ahead and use wood. I can see on a garage where I thought the smart siding was being used as an economic uh, I think, issue. you know, people, um, the thought is that it's a maintenance, that it's less maintenance than wood. I mean, that's the, that's what people say, so. Does the applicant okay. have any comments to uh, the material section? I mean, I think Katie had a lot of good points there. Um, mm -hmm. It's an addition. and. The maintenance is, is far less, it's far more durable. It, the appearance is, I would arguably say it's identical, it's gonna be painted the same. The spacing of the siding will be the same. Uh, so I don't see a visible difference that would be. I don't see a visible difference either, but I don't, it, I guess I, I'm just thinking that I thought that we were, that smart siding was a product that, and the other was a product that, um, if it was a totally different building or, and it was some feasibility that you wouldn't go out and get real siding. And what was that again? Anyway, I. So what is the difference between smart siding or smart side and something like a hardy board or a fiber cement product? Yeah. Um, one's you say dimensions? A, one's an engineered wood product and one's a cementious product. Okay, so it, smart side is a. Smart yeah. siding is a, is a engineered wood in that it's made out of wood, but it's not solid wood. Correct. Um, what Sorry, we have heard I'm, as I'm the homeowner, by the way, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Raj, I'm the contractor. Uh, what we've heard a number of times as people have come in and asked for smart side is that because it is um, derived from wood, it is a lot easier to work with than uh, fiber cement products because those or they're a lot more difficult to cut. You have to use certain tools to cut them. They'll crack if you are um, nailing into them or drilling into them, whereas smart side you can use pretty much like a piece of regular lumber. Um, That's yes. a, like a pre-primed and then you guys are gonna paint it or is it already finished with a Yes, it's gonna be painted. It's a smooth finish and it'll be painted to match the existing wood siding. Um, we, we did, I, I did a um, project right across the street. It's similar to this house. Um, it has brick and it goes, it has a transition to, we did an addition similar to this mm -hmm. and we did smart siding and we got approval for it. I know you guys don't look at other projects, but mm -hmm. at that point in time, which was, I believe it was uh, like four months ago, we had no issues with the smart side, so. Well, it is at the back of the house, and, and the majority of the house is brick, so it's just gonna be a little bit in the back, correct? Yes, that's correct. Well, it has the same appearance as smooth hardy board. So I'm not, yeah, once I don't know if I really have it's a, finished a and painted, it has the same appearance. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of a warranty, or does it, you know, is there a, a time period that it's considered to be viable? Well, I guess like the research it shows that the um, smart side it has a longer life than even you know real wood. That's why even clients I, or our customers prefer. I mean, it's interesting to hear that. But we have a lot of very old real wood 
and we don't have any. I, I know, but I, that's, what, that, that's what the research <laughs> says. That's how they right. advertise it. So. Well, does any any yeah. other commissioners have any comments? I mean, if we're going to do it in the, I mean, but I, it's not necessarily to my liking on when you can use real wood. I guess I that's that's my. And you're not using the real wood because uh, maintenance long term and yes, that's correct. And how is that part of the design? No. Sorry, I missed what you said. Well, I, I didn't know that we decided, you know, a mater historic materials based on are are these new materials more durable than the historic material? So, well, then it's better. So we'll use that instead. That doesn't, <coughs> it's not one of our criteria. I think it was one of the things with the when the green guidelines went through was we added a lot of um, a lot more flexibility for alternative materials on new construction additions. The the guideline about it said that well. The one about cementitious siding, fiber cement, um, says that it may be used at new construction of standalone primary buildings, garages, and other accessory buildings. It may also be used for additions to historic structures. So, could, could I jump in and say one thing? And, okay. What? <laughs> Go ahead. But not but now. Not now. I just want to point out, Alan Brown. Um, You'll need to identify yourself. Alan Brown, 215 Northwest 32nd. Just want to point out that the possible uh, smart siding is on, only on the addition. There is some uh, siding on the existing house, but they're not proposing to replace that with smart siding. Just want to point that out. It's on the addition, the new, new addition. I understand only. that. I guess I was just under, I, you know, maybe we did approve things on additions, but. Anyway, that would not, I don't know, maybe I voted against it at the time. I don't remember. I just, my thought has been that we were trying to limit it. Now here's a question. If, if there is a, a wood product already, you know, on some dormers or on the side of a house, and then you have an addition and you use a different product that's like the wood but different, I mean, is there any consideration on keeping, keeping the material that's already there consistent, if that makes sense? So you have kind of adding another material at that point. Do you know what is what is that wood, uh, the existing wood siding? Is it just like a, like a cedar or what kind of, do you know what kind of wood that is? On the rear of the home? Kind of on the, kind of kind of like a dormer, if I'm looking at the correct. Looks like a dormer it's, that goes It's across. painted, so we can't really tell if it's cedar, right. but it's kind of wood. You know, standard. Well, there's a motion. I don't I think I can make a motion. Or any other comments? Well, I will move to approve HPCA 18-00183, um, item six, to revise uh, the uh, original CA to include smart side siding with the specific findings in the staff recommendation. Is there a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Nay. Yeah, sorry. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. HPCA 19-00035 at 228 Northwest 32nd, uh, Edgemere Park Ward 2, consideration and possible action on application by Sam Gresham Architects for Debbie McGill for certificate of appropriateness to one replace windows elected. Which one are we on? Number three. Three, okay. All right. Good job, Klaus. I, I don't see an applicant for this one unless someone's present for 19-35, 228 Northwest 32nd. No one? Okay. Mm -hmm. Comments? 
Um, staff had recommended continuance on this one because we didn't feel that we had adequate documentation of the condition of the windows that are proposed to be replaced. So I don't think there's much beyond that to discuss. Okay. Is there a, a, a motion? I'll move to continue HPCA 19-00035, item one, replace the windows to the August, yeah, August, 7th. August 7th meeting. Okay, is there a second? I'll second it. Moved by Suzanne Broadband, and seconded by, by Lisa, Linda Schultz. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All, all, <clears throat> all opposed? Excuse me. <laughs> I think it was something else. Okay. You have been approved. I mean, continued. All right, HBCA next. HPCA 19-37 at 600 Northwest 16th. Got to get my Heritage Hills Ward 6. There. Consideration of possible action on application by Jeremy oh, okay. Gardner, Gardner Architects, for David Burnett, for certificate of appropriateness to, one, construct house with attached garage, to install driveway and curb cut elective, three, remove portions of exterior fence wall, retaining wall, and sidewalk for driveway elective, four, install sidewalks, Elective five, demolish pool cabana and landscape elements. Elective and six, repair brick steps, retaining wall, retaining and fence wall and walk. Elective. Okay, applicant is present. Must have a long name. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I had lots of words to write. Yeah. Uh, my name is Sarah Hanna. I'm with Gardner Architects. Okay. Um, here to help with any additional questions or clarifications you might need with the submission. Okay. Very good. Uh, okay. Any questions on that? On this, they've been back before. <laughs> Maybe you want to go through, yeah, what sure. changed since okay. they saw um, So the first item that was changed, originally we had talked about doing an applied slurry application to the masonry, um, and we have chosen to propose a painted masonry um, and provided some images of other houses in the area that have done the same thing. Um, along the west elevation, Originally, the committee had the impression that it was fairly sparse. Um, there weren't very many windows located there. And that was done intentionally to um, create some privacy for the property to the west. Uh, but upon your recommendation, we've chosen to add as many windows as we could without um, having to rearrange too much of the interior, which we did make some changes um, as best we could. But there were only so many things we could do. <laughs> um, and then. The other questions came up on the front porch and the columns in particular, the sizing of those. Um, I think there was com some concern that they didn't look substantial enough, especially in relationship to other historic buildings in the area. Um, and so our recommendation was to um, double up two of those same size columns um, and make it appear to be more substantial but still kind of maintain that uh, uh, thinner profile um, and then we also worked with the staff to add some detailing to the porch covering um, particularly at the even fascia condition um, to create some dimension there and then also adding some dimension to the base of the porch um, and the materials there uh, question let's see the windows that were added, did you, the neighbor next door have input on that? I, um, you guys I haven't said, heard anything. Have you heard anything from him? I remember you said that you work closely with him on that, so he's okay with <laughs> more windows. <laughs> guess he'll have. Okay I, I guess he will be. Um, in the dashed lines on the elevation that shows what's behind that? Yeah, window. we provided that in those continuation documents just to help support um, Page 20. the conversation yeah. Yeah, that we had internally, that there was um, kind of some reasoning for that interior layout, and there were only so many modifications that we wanted to make at that time, and so we've introduced as many new windows as possible. 
I don't see the previous. So how many would how many did you add? Um, let me look back. It's and been a couple Alan. Months. Did you? <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Did you ask last time to have the windows, the look of the windows modified too? Is that do I recall that correctly? I don't know. If well, I think I made a comment about that they're all the same. Um, on the, you know, the front elevation. There was discussion from the commission about um, being one over one versus introducing some divided light. Um, the applicant responded with kind of their thought process on that. There were some comments. I know there were comments from the neighborhood. There may have been comments from the commission as well about it being all single windows versus having some groupings yeah, right. um, of windows. But obviously they didn't do that, so. Um, yeah, we had looked at trying to group some windows in some locations and in some respects it's um, it affected the interior, but it also kind of changed the aesthetic of the exterior too where it seemed um, out of place and very asymmetrical in some conditions. And I'm not seeing the original. I didn't bring them with me. Perhaps, yeah. What was that? For the, um, how many we had originally proposed on the west elevation, I don't have the previous submission with me, so I don't remember how many we added. Um, but I think we're recalling at least two were on the west elevation, and now there's. There were two, and now there's what we were shown. We have nine. Nice to see the previous one, but the other question I had is the uh, don't quite understand the detail. I don't know if it was like this before of the metal railing that's die it's elevated, dying into the column that has a a metal base on the post. Yeah, so part of that move was um, kind of continuing the line of that railing there, but also trying to break up the vertical repetition that was happening that we thought contributed to some of the concern with the columns. Um, and so this helped emphasize the horizontal. Um, and it also helped with some of the kind of conditions where that railing is dying into this porch um, post too that we were trying to address in detailing. Haven't seen a detail quite like that. Do you know what we're talking about? <laughs> it's on page uh, A312 or 30 of 59. Wow. Um, they've put a curb around the porch, a foot tall, and then elevated uh, a 24 inch railing, total 36 inches, which is code. Um, it dies into the, or butts into uh, the column, and it says it has a metal base. So I assume it's just a wrap, like a... Um, yeah, we've kind of been playing around with how this actually gets constructed, but our thought originally was that the wood post continues in a sort of offset at that base condition, just enough of the width of the, the metal... Um, base that it'll be going into, and then it sits flush. The face of the wood post is flush with the face of the metal base. Um, and then in terms of that condition where those two are going to meet, um, we're still kind of working through how to avoid any issues with water potentially getting into that location. Behind the metal? Yeah. It's like a sleeve, right? Yes, yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Does it show on the... Uh Renderings or anything? Um, I think what we submitted in the continuation was just revised um, rendered elevations. We didn't do a revised rendering okay. from the street. But it does show in those elevations. So the railing is kind of centered on the post, I guess? Or how, how does it die into the post? 
Um, this is a great question. So uh, I think there's a couple ways it could go down. We talked a little bit about if those those post bases and the railing are sort of fabricated as one piece and they're getting installed as sort of the two columns and the railing between and then the next bay and then the next bay um, or they could potentially be separated. Gotcha, kind but the railing's there. between the posts, mm -hmm. kind of mounted in there. Okay. Yeah, centered, yes, correct. Gotcha. Hmm. I guess I've never seen this curve around the porch. Usually the, there's the porch and then there's the railing and there's usually a, a four inches something. Yeah, I think that condition, um, the goal initially was to try and uh, speak to the detail we were doing at the windows with the cast stone sill um, and then we would have the soldier coursing oh. above the window um, and so the, the fascia in its dimension sort of replicates that. So I you see have that now. It's the same height as the window sill. Yes. Yep. I see that now. Okay. Hmm. Any, any other comments? I'm hogging the. No, I think you address uh, pretty much you know the comments that we had last time, more or less. Was there, was there some question about the the front retaining wall? I, from what I recall, was there a question about the the lawn? Wanting that to slope instead of being a retaining wall, is that something that, is that, the, is that this? Um, I think. Of having a berm instead yes, of a Yes, yes. What you may be recalling is that the retaining yes. wall would oh, be yeah. reconstructed along 16th to match um, that of, yeah, this image will work, um, match what's there, and the front lawn may have to get sort of regraded a little bit to, you know, handle the transition from that retaining wall to the front of the house. But I would imagine that it would be similar to what you're seeing on the neighbor to the west there. Um, Any other questions? We have somebody would like to speak to, so welcome back. Randy Ice, Heritage Hill Design Review Committee. <clears throat> you have my comments, I assume? Uh, yeah. All right. The, um, uh, this is an unusual piece of property. It's the only lot on that block that's in Heritage Hills. And it's because of, a, of, a, of a, a lot split that was approved by the commission at some previous point. So this was the backyard of a house from Heritage Hills. The rest of the block is in Mesta Park, including the house just next door. So we don't have uh, as, as much information as we would like from the next door neighbor. Normally we try to talk to the, to the neighbors if they're in the neighbor association. Oftentimes we know these people from other situations. But we did have a letter last time. We were very concerned that the letter was addressed. Um, our biggest concern, as, as we've expressed before on new construction in the area, is that original setbacks, as prescribed by the plat over 100 years ago, are honored. Now, the question on this particular lot, because it was never developed, does it fall under the plat restrictions from the block behind or the block that it's on since you divided the, or allowed the division of the uh, lot? All right. Uh, it, now, first of all, can you tell me the distance from the property line to the west side of the house? Um, I think we talked about it last time. I believe it's eight or nine feet, um, but I will need to check the site plan here. It says 10 foot, 10 inches maybe here. Oh, okay. The edge of the garage to the property line, it looks like. Well, that's our biggest concern because we want equal spacing with the other houses on the block and we want it to comply with the uh, abstract restrictions. As you know from a previous case this year, we had issues with, a, with a, a, a person building on a vacant lot in the neighborhood and they were building it right up on top of the uh, setbacks that were prohibited by the original uh, plat restrictions. And this puts the neighborhood in a very difficult position of having to take legal action if a house is built that violates the covenants. And we don't want to have that to happen. It doesn't sound like that's the case here if you're, if you're back eight foot. We are okay. eight feet. Uh, I was concerned. That I couldn't really read the, the materials that were sent to me. It looked to me like a three, and it probably was an eight. It's but an three eight. foot would not be sufficient, and uh, that was our biggest concern there. Now, we, we also made some design uh, comments last time. We like roof windows. We like more windows on the west. Uh, many of the things that were changed in this actually please the neighborhood greatly. Good. Uh, so uh, Good. I was just mostly here to talk about the, uh, the, the west side setback because the neighbor was so concerned about it. But we were unable to uh, reach the neighbor. We were hoping uh, he would be here, but, but apparently not. Well, maybe you can clarify on, on uh, 
page 22 of 59, I guess it's A111. Yeah. You've got a side plan oh. here, and there's a really, oh, sorry. Oh, there's a really faint, so you have the property line, which is in red. You got a really faint gray line. And I don't think it's really called out. Do you know what that line represents? Are you referring to the existing site plan on the left side of the page or the proposed site plan on the, the right? The proposed okay. site plan. Uh, a, it's yeah. real faint, kind of on the corner where that notch is out of the uh, retaining wall. It looks like a building line, is it? That's what I said. So it's sort of uh, sh a shape, like a polygon shape. It's a vertical, there. vertical That's the, line. It's a vertical line. Or just a vertical dash line. It's on the east face of oh, your... Oh, the, the red? It's a red on your... No, not or? the red one. I'm oh, sorry. To the I'm left and the red. red. <laughs> yeah. It's, it lines up right with the garage on that uh, west side. Or on the east side, rather. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's 10 foot 10 inches from... Oh, I'm sorry, Randy. You were talking about uh, on the uh, west side of the house between the neighbors, right? Is that correct? I believe that line on the east side is just showing you the alignment with structures up and down um, oh Dewey. sorry, sorry yes. on the work. east it's side not, yeah not that's not aligning with the yeah. property so directly it was to just the showing north. that alignment no, I got yeah. wrong. so Randy you're talking about on the, uh, the west side between the houses is there 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 too? between that's the houses okay. is where we okay. were concerned yes mm -hmm. oh. so that's uh, yeah that looks like it's so like eight foot two or six foot two I can't really read that it's eight foot two there okay. to the porch and then it's eight feet to the the house Okay. Is there a, uh, set, a setback on that street, the side street? On Building Dewey setback? or on the, the side west street, side? which would be Dewey, yes. Um, I don't know that off the top of my head um, what the requirement might be. Um, I think initially in planning it was to align with the property directly. Well, that, in the plat, they'll, they'll have a building line. Yeah, I assume I, the build, you're within the building line too. This is, hasn't come up. It doesn't show on here where the, where the building line is. Yeah, we don't have it shown on this site plan here. We just what? have the property line. And I don't recall one being over there. Do you remember? Yeah. Well, the plant will have a building line in the front. And then they'll have a setback on the side. Right. That's one, you know, when I was building my house in Jefferson Park, kind of had that issue because you know, if you applied kind of the city, typical setbacks of 25 feet from the front, 15 from the side, it really, it's kind of a unique lot and it didn't leave a whole lot to be developed. And, you know, I think the standard for the HP is you match kind of the adjacent structures. Plats normally have a building line. They do have a building line on, a, this is, on both sides, I, this, on the corner. I, I think we looked at that early on, and I know we looked at the plat quite a bit when they were just first initially applying to divide the lot. Yeah. Um, so I think they are within what's allowed, but we can certainly Confirm. check. That. I mean, yes. they're not, if, yeah. if they're not meeting those requirements, they're not going to be able to get a permit anyway. Right. So we'll, well, not, not, yeah. we'll figure that out. So that would be um, on the north and on the east, and then the side yard on the uh, west would be covered by Normal side yard setbacks, I assume. I think five, it's five feet minimum. Right. I think you're well within that range. Yeah, so you're at eight. Yeah. So I think they're within, assuming the plat works, checks out. Most of the neighborhood has five or six foot side setbacks, but the plat does specify setbacks from the street on both sides. So as long as those are looked at, and of course the building department will look at that as well. Yes, uh, yeah, and that was, I mean, done in initial planning. It's just I'm not recalling the exact distance that is required, so I'd have to confirm so that I don't misspeak. But, I mean, also just to make the point that it is aligning with the existing structures was the intention initially um, directly to the north and to the south as well, so. Usually a side, the, along a side street, I believe it's 15 feet. I think so. Yeah. So that would be city. more than what's shown here. But anyway, we're going to check it out, and the city won't right. kick it back. If it doesn't. Well, I mean, I think, I think uh, not to bring a different project into it, but I think my house is less than that, too, just what's that? matching the pattern development. You know, the house that I built, it was different than the city kind of standard R1 setbacks as well, just kind of matching the historic. There's a city standard, and then there's the plat. There's two different yeah, things so. that kind of govern. So, um, OK. Anything else on this? Oh, uh, 
You got the sign sheet. Okay. I was supposed to tell you the sign. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Do we need to talk about the demolition of the pool cabana and all of that too? Anything in there that causes concern? I think we kind of talked about that last time. We know that the pool, or we're fairly confident the pool cabana is not historic. Um, and then as far as the landscape elements, I don't know dates for all of those, but generally with backyard features like that, we would, you know, allow things like swimming pools and fencing and little retaining walls and such to be um, removed, replaced, kind of regardless of age. Okay, any other comments or questions? We've been through this thing a couple times, so. <laughs> well, I'll make a motion to uh, approve HPCA 19-00037 items five, actually. You can just do all items unless there's something you want to yeah. call out. No, yeah, all items. <laughs> okay. Um, with the specific findings as noted in the staff report. Okay, is there a second? Well, the, the staff report recommended continuance, so you might oh. want to look oh, at the findings my bad. <laughs> for a couple of things. You don't want that. <laughs> We're getting so, uh, so, yeah, um, improve HPCA uh, 190037. Um, items one through five, is that correct? They did recommend approval of one staff, so you could use those. Uh, one, let's see, five. So I think the, the easiest six. thing to do with this, if you just want to kind of revise the findings that are for the items that recommended continuance, is to just, um, if I was going to rewrite these for approval, um, that under staff recommendation number two, specific findings, um, number keep number one, um, and number two, change it to say that they are compatible. Um, uh, keep number three, and keep number four. Okay. So with the specific findings, or one, three, and four, and that the uh, Elements of the proposed design um, are compatible with the historic character of the surrounding district. It's item one. What? One and one, three. Sorry, six. And then all other findings as shown in the staff report. I shown the staff report, correct. Yeah. I don't see two. Ah, okay, got it. All right. Is that everybody clear on that? Clear as much. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, so it's been moved by Klaus Ryman Phillip and seconded by Taylor Fudge. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. That item has been approved. Thank you. Can't wait to see it. All right. Next. Uh, HPCA 19-69 at 634 Northwest 20th Street, Master Park Ward 6, consideration and possible action on application by Craig Cook, Oasis Real Estate LLC, for certificate of appropriateness to one, remove wrap around, wrap around portion of front porch elective, two, install driveway elective, three, replace, extend front walkway and steps elective, and four, reconstruct rear addition with hip roof elective. The commission saw this one previously as well. Um, we know that the wraparound or extended portion of the porch is not original, or we presume it's not based on the sandboard maps and what the you know, applicant feels just from looking at the construction of it. Um, previously, they had proposed to modify that to create kind of a portico share, but have revised that to just um, put the porch back to the historic footprint and just put a a driveway that is not covered along the side of the house. Um, the other item that is here that we didn't look at the last time is essentially reconstructing a very small addition on the back of the house so that it doesn't fall down. 
and um, modifying the roof to kind of tie in with the, the rest of the roof of the structure. Hello? State your name, please. Uh, Craig Cook, Oasis Real Estate. Okay. I have one question for you. Uh, you kind of did what we were talking about. You kind of just chopped off the extension, mm -hmm. uh, so it's now a, like a gable. Uh, right. Is it possible you could turn that in, into a... Um, Hip it out. What? To extend it out. No, uh, I drew it here. So the front, uh, one side is like this, mm -hmm. and the other side would be a vertical. Could you yeah. do both of them um, with a... Uh, so uh, kind of... The, pitched roof on the on the two sides. Yeah. So kind of the uh, the pitch on that part of the thought on that was we were going to apply to to have add covered parking at a later date and time. Oh. So we were kind of trying to leave, and I, I spoke with Katie about this at depth, and she kind of had a different design of something that she thought might get approved. So part of that was that, but no, I mean, yeah, we could definitely. Pitch that out to the side to. But you, but you had a reason for it. I mean, it's, the house is not symmetrical, so it's not totally important. But I just thought it looked better than just being chopped off. You guys have any questions? Well, I can agree with that. I mean, I could see. Uh, you know, it's kind of you have that vertical hard. It kind of looks like it got chopped off versus <laughs> it would look more natural. I think if you had the kind of the angle there in the hip, you know, yep. on the porch. But uh, I think otherwise it. It looks good. Katie, what was your, about the 10 foot? I was going to ask, why did you, did you see the comment about the 10 feet on the, on the uh, yes. drive? Um, uh, two things there. Um, we're not opposed to, to swaying the driveway. We would have to turn the driveway there anyway. There's a uh, water, city water access um, kind of right in the corner. You can't see it. So we would have to sway the driveway in and then come out to the, property line at the corner of the porch anyway so um so yeah we're we're in favor of keeping it at the 10 feet and then extending it out at the at the corner of the house oh okay could you provide a just a revised sketch to staff yes just to be clear on the porch roof are we saying to make it a like a hip on the east side the same as on the west that side. That was a that was a suggestion, but I don't think it's critical. Um, what do you guys think? Because the house isn't symmetrical. And he has a reason why he didn't want to do that. I don't it's know. A pretty what quirky house. I mean, yeah, it's kind of <laughs> quirky. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, understand what we're saying. I, mean, I think it's fine. Part of his improvement plans going forward. Apparently, we'll see it again. The house is going to be super awesome. Everybody should come see it when it's finished. <laughs> I know it's been kind of a sore in everybody's side in the neighborhood since we started it. Um, you know, I've had numerous people come to speak to me about they wish it would have just been demolished. But I mean, the house is going to be an amazing house when it's finished. One thing I did want to ask, though, I've had several, several people, and I believe Lee called to speak with you about it too. Um, Several people in the neighborhood would at least like me to replace the cedar shake off of the columns themselves. They don't believe that that is. We must historic. have evidence. I mean, as I spoke last time, there is evidence. There's only three sides of the house itself with cedar shake on it. Right. The back portion, the southeast corner of the house, um, is lap siding. I mean, I would think that. I mean, you would just have to find evidence on a post that. Okay showed that there was siding or something else versus that. If you, if you had that, I don't, that would not be an issue. Or I mean, a, is anybody telling me here, though, that they believe that cedar shake is original on those columns? Yeah, well, we must have evidence. Okay. I would say if there's something under that on the there's column. No, I, or, I've looked, okay. there's nothing there. Or I if mean, it's a matter of looking at the shakes themselves and being able to kind of tell by the quality of those that they are well, I mean newer. we can see how it was put up we can see yeah looking you know, at that I mean the yeah. construction of it itself they, they, they weren't original that's something I think we'd want to um, yeah get some good photos and kind of lay out this is these are the reasons that 
we're confident this is not the original condition and then have a proposal for what you're going back with? I mean, I'm, I'm not here to argue about it. I'll leave them. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not going to live in the house, but it's something that the neighborhood has brought to me. I, I think that, you know, after you've got it all finished with your, you know, the things that you're doing, I think that it will look a lot better. Yeah. I mean, they just, they, they don't look natural to the house at all. There, there was a neighbor that called, and um, I thought it was going to be one of those calls telling on someone for something, but she talked about what a great job you'd done at another property. Um, had very kind words to say, and then she said, I've lived by this house for decades. Um, you know, I, I'm sure that those shingles are not the original material. Um, wouldn't the commission let him take those off? So I don't know that she has any sort of documentation of that, but she seemed quite confident. I think since you've heard from so many neighbors, it would be worthwhile to kind of ask around if people... Nobody That's seems a, to, I mean, nobody has any documentation, but I, mean, I, I just really feel like that it's very rare that evidence of something else is not under there, be it different kinds of nails or something that was behind there for things to be attached to, or it appears that maybe there was some strips applied so they could put the shingles on. But they, they, they stripped everything. Everything's been stripped. And I mean, I could go, I mean, there's, there's plywood a plywood material underneath the cedar shake so plywood could be evidence right if if, if it's not original no right if yeah. there are boxed plywood columns then that could be evidence but um just need we need something maybe there's something underneath the plywood right. like a column it's very rare that people like take the column off and then build a plywood box, it would be more typical that they would just build a plywood box around an existing column and then put the shingles on it. So if you might want to take one apart and just see what you can find. Um, the, the shingles are not actually on the agenda, so we, we can't do anything about right. it at this point anyway, but I think we can talk further about yeah. next steps. But I think there's some options there. I have a question for you, I just, on the driveway. Uh, they're limited to a 10 foot driveway, is that correct? Is that right? Sure, 10 feet, but he's going to extend it the 10 feet all the way to the front of the house and then go out. He's going to bring another plan in. Okay, I missed that conversation. Okay. And then we talked last time, I thought you were going to move the driveway over to the property line. Yes. Uh, Katie's findings were to keep it at 10 feet until we get to the corner of the house and then extend it out to the property line which is even with the side of the garage there. But are you going to give us a, a drawing of that? Yeah, I can redraw that, yes. Prior okay. to CA, yes. Say, say again what you're going to bring back. So we'll come in, it, and it, it may have to be slightly under 10 feet. I'll get the measurements on it. But you can see right here, I don't know if you can really tell, but right here kind of a little bit to the right of the leaf in the picture there, there's a city water access there, a manhole cover there. So we'll have to fade inside of that manhole cover anyway. What does fade inside of mean? Right. It's kind of so that's going to keep us inside that 10 foot anyway. And then. Well, we'll I guess up. is the driveway up going to be aligned with the property line or what you've got at now? The back. What? Yeah, at the, towards the, at the corner of the house, we'll go to the property line. I'm looking at your side plan. I'm they, talking about the front of the house, not the back. No, at the front, it will not. I can't go that far over there. Because there's of a the manhole water. Cover there. What, what's there? There's a manhole cover there. Manhole. There's city water okay, access I, I, there. There's a water meter. Well, we limit. I wasn't following along. Because we so. limit the driveways to 10 feet. Right. So the manhole is blocking you from moving the driveway over. But yeah, okay. I have to, I'd have to fade around that anyway. Yeah, fade. It means kind of. Does that mean curve? <laughs> is it not going to be a straight driveway? It's no, it'll be straight, and then it'll angle out to the property line. And at so, the how much of the house. concrete are you going to have angled out? It looks uh, like it's not going to be a lot because it's not a very far. This, it's distance okay. there. Right. Looks so like it might be about fourteen. -ish. Looks like we might need total. He has thirteen. Well, he has fourteen feet, five inches. Okay. So right now it fans out in the front yard. That point where it spreads out to the. 14-foot um, width will move back to be in line with the front corner of the house. Gotcha. So, so you'll have a, a you know, 10-foot 
or oh. less driveway all right. the way to the house, right. and then it'll fan out a little gotcha. bit. Gotcha. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's one of the a lot of concrete in front of the house, so there will be, it'll be less. Yep. Less. Um, right. We just noticed that there's not actually a recommendation for item three, which is just to extend the front walkway and replace the concrete steps. There were no issues with that. We that would all qualify for administrative approval anyway. So I think um, if we're approving other items, you could just approve add that. that in. Yeah. I would make a motion to approve HPCA 19-00069 with the specific findings as noted by the staff for items one, two, one, one, and for no, one. For item two, the findings and the condition that the driveway be limited to 10 feet to the front of the house with the second condition that a revised drawing be submitted prior to the CA. And uh, number four, with the specific findings and the unique circumstances listed by staff. And that we also approve item three to replace and extend the front walkway and steps. Uh, with the condition that that be clear, if you'll just, you want is that on the drawing already? Uh, no, I, yeah, I think we have drawings of that already. Okay. So. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Joe Meacham, seconded by Suzanne Broadbent. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. So approved just on the new drawing with the The new drawing with the, the driveway, driveway, and I think that's it. All right, perfect. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay. HPCA 19-70 at 3016 North Robinson, Jefferson Park, Ward 2, consideration of possible action on application by Justin Wright for Jack Chamberlain, 945 Uptown, LLC, for certificate of appropriateness to one replace roof elective. And this is one that um, Steph actually didn't have any concerns on this. It was just not something that we could administratively approve. Um, it is replacing a m historic metal roof with a modern metal roofing product. It's not an exact match for what was there, um, but we did recommend approval. And we've seen this um, exact product a couple of times here recently. Okay. Could you state your name, please? Uh, Justin Wright. Okay. Thank you. Justin, did you have anything to add? I don't think so. Unless y'all had questions, it's really what I came for. I'm excited to get this job done. <laughs> well, it seems pretty straightforward to me and, and a, a good project. We're actually putting it more back, putting it back to a more historical accurate than it is now. I'm not saying that right, but hopefully you'll understand. Well, uh, if we're ready, I'll move approval of HPCA 19-00070 zero with the specific findings and unique circumstances as listed in the staff report. Okay, is there a second? All second. Moved by Suzanne Broadbent, seconded by Klaus Ryan and Philip. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Approved. Thank you. <laughs> it was easier than thought, right? <laughs> HPCA 19-72 at 116 Northwest 15th Street, Heritage Hills, Ward 6. Consideration and possible action on application by Christina Brightwell Thompson, MKJ Properties, LLC, for certificate of appropriateness to one replace retaining wall elective. Christina Brightwell Thompson. Great. Okay. I, I did my application three times. Uh, Angela Yetter was very helpful, and I'm pretty sure what you have in front of you is the first thing that I asked for, which is a stained and stamped concrete wall. She said that wouldn't be approved, and so I rewrote my application again, um, but she helped me submit it, and that was the one that made it to you instead of what I'm actually asking for, which is just a plain concrete wall. Uh, I would like to stain it, but if not, I won't if okay. it's not. Do you know when that, when you last sent that to her? 
Yeah, um, it was via email a couple of weeks ago, and then she went out of town, and so I couldn't reach her to try to swap in the correct okay. um, paperwork. Okay. okay. Well, um, we staff can administratively approve just the concrete retaining wall, um, or we could, the commission could approve that with the condition that staff confirm we have all the accurate documentation either way. Well, since we're here, might as well do that. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody would like to do that? Sure. So uh, the motion would be to replace it with just a plain concrete wall. Yeah. The, the wow. only change, I think you have the site plan that I drew on with green magic marker where I wanted to curve it a little bit because when you're walking up to the steps, there's kind of a really harsh line and I think that it would ingress and egress better if the, that wall was slightly curved away from the steps. You can, you can see it in the picture. It's just kind of moving that corner to make it round. Yeah. What would you approve? <laughs> um, I generally, without would not. looking at it more closely, I wouldn't um, approve a curved retaining wall just because we don't typically see that. Okay. These properties. Um, usually it either has a curve and it turns the corner and goes back in or it just kind of stops there and meets the yard where it slopes down. Okay, but we're putting so, it into the staffs. Yeah, I uh, think staff can uh, work with uh, you uh, yeah. to get the final design. So you want to okay. make a motion on that? I'll make a motion to approve HPCA 19-00072 um, item. Item one, replace retaining wall. Um, with a condition that you coordinate with staff on how to implement that. File design. Okay. Is there a second? Okay, then moved by Klaus Ryan-Field, seconded by Joe Meacham. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed? Okay. Thank you. approved conditionally. Thank you. Thank you. 19-77 at 800 Northwest 41st Street, Crown Heights Ward 2, consideration and possible action on application by Virgil Onan, Carrion Homes, LLC, for Donald Horton for certificate of appropriateness to one, replace skylight with dormer elective. Uh, I did want to say that there's some photos in the PowerPoint that show an addition under construction, and those are old photos. So in case anyone <laughs> gets, can, those are photos that we took of the property uh, years ago <laughs> um, when construction was going on. I'm not sure if an applicant Looks is like present. Not here. Um, yeah. This, in summary, there is an existing skylight that is right next to the chimney, and they're having water issues with the way that was done. Um, because of where the skylight is and the additional height that it creates on the interior of the house, it doesn't work to just, there's a shower there, I believe. So it doesn't work to just remove the skylight and continue the roof um, in its normal configuration. What they've proposed is a small uh, dormer um, with no windows. I guess that's still a dormer. Uh, so um, yeah. staff, I believe, recommended continuance. We were not confident that that was the best design solution um, for that issue. So I don't know if there's any kind of quick feedback the commission would want us to forward on to the applicant, or we can just continue it to another meeting. Yeah. Uh, you see things like that sometimes uh, in number of houses where they'll create a little, um, just a little pr protrusion, you know. It's like a dorm with no windows. It's a, I guess it's a dormette or something. A dorm. But I've seen those a lot. Usually I'd recommend taking them off. <laughs> Kind of like a add-on, but uh, I I don't think it's. I mean, I think they need to just fix their skylight. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, I mean surely I they could find a way to repair it to where it doesn't leak. Right. Or we'll get a new one that doesn't intersect with the chimney, which I think is the problem. That detail looks pretty bad. Mm -hmm. But should we continue it since the applicant's not here? Maybe there's some other information that they could add. Because it's on a side street. We usually don't approve. Right, it's on a corner, so that's going to be a 
visible feature. Uh, yeah, I think to continue to August 7th, so we've got time to get back with them. Okay. Would I like to do that? Okay, I will. Move to continue HPCA 19-00077 to the August 7th meeting. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All Moved move by Suzanne Broadbent and seconded by Joe Meacham. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it's continued. Next. HPCA 19-79 at 620 Northwest 41st Street, Crown Heights Ward 2. Consideration of possible action on application by Laura Steen for certificate of appropriateness to one enclosed back porch elective. This is an existing screen porch at the rear corner of the property. It is somewhat visible from the driveway, but it's pretty minimal. And the applicant has proposed to enclose that. Um, staff recommended approval with a condition um, that they inset it slightly um, so that it's not just a solid continuation of the, the brick wall. We have seen things like this before where it was a very, very small addition where we didn't require them to do an inset or a reveal or anything because it was so minor, um, but included that because the guidelines do talk about features like that with an addition. Hmm. I was just wondering if it would be appropriate to use siding. I mean, there is siding there. That would work. Because it, it's in the same plane, you'd have to match the brick and, you know, uh, is the applicant here? I didn't ask. No, uh, the applicant the is not present, not so present. I think either we approve as submitted or continue? Can continue and say they need to revise. I don't know what you guys think. I, I would think it would look, I think, better if it was siding, and there is siding on the house. What do you, what do you think? It's kind of, kind of tough to tell on the elevations. What? What? Well, did they... Were, were they in agreement on, or did you just, did they you get feedback on when you, uh, on your condition of being inset? You know, I have not heard from them since the packet went out. Um, Angelo was working with this applicant, so I'm not sure to what extent they talked about that. And I just, just realized that they're moving the wall out, so they're reusing the brick and the window, so that helps matching. And I saw you had a condition that you mentioned uh, for them to step the brick in, I guess, and to differentiate. Katie, is that correct? Um, yes. Yeah, we proposed that condition. I, I do not know if they've agreed to that condition. Gotcha. I haven't heard from them. So given that they're not here, do we continue? Okay. I think I would. Uh, what was the, sorry, what was the date? Uh, um, I think we could continue this to July 3rd because it's basically a matter of they just haven't agreed agree to that agree. condition. Yeah. Okay. I'll make a motion to continue HPCA 19-00079 to the July 3rd uh, Historic Preservation Commission meeting. Second. Okay. It's been moved by Klaus Ryman Philp and seconded by Suzanne Broadbent. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Continued. Next. HPCA 19-80 at 1545 Northwest 36th Street, Putnam Heights, Ward 2. Consideration and possible action on application by Sherlyn Ashby for certificate of appropriateness to one demolished garage required. Um, as we can see, this is one that did already occur. The applicant was able to provide quite a bit of documentation on the garage um, prior to it having been demolished. Um, while we never... Uh, you know, condone doing work without a CA. We did feel that, staff did feel that the garage as documented was one that we would have recommended approval for the demolition just based on the condition. Sorry you had to wait so long. Hi, I'm Sherlyn Ashby. Yeah. That's a heck of a crack in that slab. Yes. There's a big tree in the back that kind of probably resulted in that. Like the typical garage crack, <laughs> right down the middle. You could lose a, lose a small animal in that crack. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, looks. Uh, I'm just curious, how how did a permit get issued without a CA? 
I mean, did you hire a contract? I got somebody from Craigslist. I'm sorry? Craigslist. They didn't get a permit. You don't need a permit. I contacted him. He said he could do it the next day. I didn't really believe him, and I went out there, and it was gone. <sighs> okay. Well, Sherlyn, I, of course, this is just two doors down from me, <clears throat> and, and I don't particularly miss that garage. Um, I, 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 I do have to say that our neighborhood's pretty keen on people getting CAs ahead of time. I know, um, and I, I've tried to. My... Income doesn't allow me to live in the neighborhood. I literally have to move out. I can't maintain the level of maintenance you want on that. When I moved into that neighborhood, I did not know the consequences of living in a historic neighborhood. I'm a single individual. I have one paycheck. I can't afford it. I have, when I moved in, the garage was derelict already. It had holes in the roofs. The sides had holes in it. Uh, the realtor told me that the individual that I purchased it from had driven a car through the back of the garage. It's six inches or so off its foundation. Um, the first time the city came and looked at it, um, you know, I tried to go through the proper channels to get things done. Uh, I got a quote from an architect to reconstruct it. I didn't have that kind of income, so I had two very good friends. We literally took uh, posts and jacks. We propped up the roof. My friend's husband was brave enough to get on the roof, laid down um, plywood. He re-roofed it for me. We've um, re-roofed it three times. We have uh, replaced the siding two or three times on the west side because it was so swayed out. Uh, one of the garage doors on the east side had a broken spring. You lift, try to lift it up. It literally falls off or fall, fell off the tracks. You're lucky if you don't have a head injury. I could get the west side been open, but um, the building sways when you do that. Uh, I would not ever have used it. It's not, it wasn't safe. I got yeah, Christmas like ornaments in it and the Christmas tree, and that was about it. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like you've made some efforts. Um, I, I do notice that, if I'm reading this cor correct, demolition was approved in 1999. Yes, so and that's I when I, I tried to go through the proper channels and, and get it done. But, you know, nope. I just graduated from nursing school. I didn't have, nope. I only made $27,000 that year. To replace yeah. that, it would have been 20000 There's no way. Yeah. That's 20 years ago. <laughs> I've, put, I've been band-aiding it and putting pretty makeup on it since then, basically, just to make it, keep it painted, keep it roofed. But. So, so when the demolition was approved in 1999, I, you're thinking that it meant you would have to build I was told I would have space. one year to replace it. Ah, okay. you, you said what? Pardon? What did you just say? I didn't hear you. Uh, in 1999, when I told that I, when I was told that I could do it, uh, I was instructed that that time by the commission that I would have one year to replace it if I tore oh, it down. Okay. Ah. And I don't think I was going to make that much money in one year. Do we still do that? I can't remember. No. Do yeah, we, we, don't we, we now, our municipal councilor's office has advised us that we do not have the ability to make you build back a garage when you've been approved to demolish a garage. Obviously, we want garages to go back um, and people to build appropriate structures, but we wouldn't require that today. So, well, I'm I wish I'd known that. that. That's one of the reasons why I've left the neighborhood. I cannot live under these conditions where you make people do things that are not feasible. So, well, we wouldn't I'm, say that, but <laughs> <laughs> sometimes people think are, we're unreasonable, but we have to enforce the guidelines. But, but things have changed, too. So. I didn't know that. The I do apologize are, for that. I wish I'd known. Yeah. Guidelines aren't as subjective as they used to be. For one thing, the house would have been paid off. I paid off that house about a year and a half ago, and I would have no house payment. Now I have, starting all over. But, mm. Mm. Well, if we're ready, I'll move to approve okay. the uh, approve HPCA 19-00080, item 1, with the specific findings uh, in the staff report. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, moved by Suzanne Broadbent and seconded by Klaus Ryman Phillip. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, been approved. Thank you.
Thank you. All right. Uh, on to other. That's the last of our individual. And on to other business. A. So we have a consideration and possible recommendation to the Planning Commission and City Council for approval of proposed changes to the guidelines. These are specifically in regard to small cells. Um, the small 25 to 35 foot poles that um, are being installed all over the city for um, all over the country for wireless. Um, recently, the uh, state legislature passed um, legislation that kind of defines where and how cities can regulate small cells um, because it is a um, kind of a public amenity that people are allowed to have, that companies are allowed to install. So this is for ones that go in the right of way. Um, it uh, allows us to still put them through a design review process for design review in historic districts, but we have to have, um, I'm looking for the language that it says, reasonable and objective guidelines to apply. And it also has some requirements for the timing of the review process, which were somewhat in compliance with what we already do. We already have um, time frames within our ordinance for reviewing projects. The intent here was to ensure that these could be administratively approved, if at all possible, and to update the section of our guidelines that talks about um, utilities and other amenities in the public right of way so that it would specifically identify small cell wireless facilities and provide guidelines kind of appropriate to their installation as opposed to something like a, um, a, like a water meter or something that is closer to the ground. Um, so we've got just a few, um, you've got a two pages of the guidelines where they are actually changed. We are essentially inserting small wireless facilities into the list of utility components under site and landscape considerations, public property and right-of-way of improvements. Um, there is a change from a must to a should, uh, and then from painted to designed to more specifically mean the entire design, not just the color scheme. And that should is then conditioned with the new section that's underlined in the rest of the guideline that addresses um, when the component has to be in a visible location because these are somewhat dictated by the function that they serve that tells the companies where they have to be installed. Um, uh, there are various guidelines there for how they how to minimize the visual impact. Um, so this is a, because our guidelines are, are adopted as if laid out within the ordinance, they go through the same process for revision as an ordinance amendment. So this will go um, with a batch of other changes to all the other design re review districts guidelines as well to planning commission and then on to city council uh, for so, adoption. Go ahead. Um, so this commission is going to decide on a cellular tower where and when it's feasible or not, place it based on the function of a wireless tower are we going to decide that based on what the wireless provider gives us? I mean, I'm trying to figure out exactly what kind of technical decisions this is going to make us make because everything is should instead of must and can instead of will. And so that means there's decisions involved. Laura, most of do you want to speak to the... Most of it's staff review, administrative review. Right, so I'm Laura McDevitt in the city attorney's office. Uh, so the wireless providers will be giving the information on where specifically these need to be cited. So, and it's also going to be partially dictated by where we might have other utilities or ADA access or those other kinds of requirements where specifically it needs to be located on that particular block. So will it go through other city departments before? Yes. Okay. So there'll be agreement by other engineers. Right, yeah, the, it'll have to go through, throughout the city, wherever these small cells are going to be located, they'll be going through a similar review process by uh, 
traffic, um, you know, everybody in public works, development services, um, making sure utilities, making sure that there aren't going to be any conflicts with our in existing city infrastructure. You would basically get a revocable permit then for that? Yeah. Or, uh, okay. But so when they're located in a historic preservation district, then they'll also be required to get the certificate of appropriateness um, through city staff. So it looks like, so they have to apply for a CA, but it looks like we're not going to see very many unless those three under commission review or Katie kicks it to us to look at. So do you see what I'm saying? Most of this is about is administrative review. So the, the state statute that was passed has some very tight time frames, which under most circumstances could prohibit commission review of these to begin with. And that the, there's the requirements that the um, standards be reasonable, objective, and published in advance. So they're looking for very concrete things. If they submit a black pole in areas with other black poles, you know, there's not a whole lot of room for too much discretion. There's a lot of, there's going to be a lot of these things. Are they going to submit in a group? Surely not going to do Sometimes CAs. they do. Yeah. Every single poll, that would be a lot of CAs. Right. <laughs> it's, it's a number of different companies because you've got AT&T and Verizon yeah. and all these different um, cell Good. companies. And yes, sometimes they, they will bring in a large batch of them. You could be inundated by yes. wireless. Um, yes. We do have the ability to, um, the same as we do with our current applications, we have the ability to you know, do an initial review of the application and let them know if there is something missing. And that somewhat stops the clock to say, OK, you need to provide your site plans not accurate, or you haven't given us the, the drawings that show the dimensions of the proposed installation, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, the intent is to make it very clear so we can get them through the process and approved. Well, so far, the ones that have been brought, they've been <clears throat> fairly um, cooperative with our concerns. Um, the fact of the matter is we've been pretty well preempted by state and federal law. So um, I think this is as good as it's going to get. So what do we need to do? Recommend this to the Planning Commission and City Council, okay? Somebody like to make a motion? Set up here. I'll make a motion to uh, recommend the design guideline revisions for the small cell towers um, to City Council. Second. Planning Commission and City Council. Planning Commission and City Council. I bet. Okay. It's been moved and moved by Klaus Ryan Phillips, seconded by Suzanne Broadbent. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. It's been uh, sent on. And now, thank you, Laura. Uh, communications reports, administrative approvals. Um, administrative approvals. Uh, Angela is currently out, so don't ask me any questions at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you want to know something about one, um, email me or give me a call and we can get you more information. Um, no withdrawals or administrative closures. Uh, the two National Register nominations that we reviewed recently were recommended um, by City Council to be forwarded on to the State Historic Preservation Office and the National Park Service. Um, three. On three, uh, <laughs> Council um, on May 21st took action to um, withdraw the HP Commission's initiation of the landmark designation for First Christian Church and to execute a memorandum of understanding between the city, First Christian Church, and Crossings Community Church that addresses um, it agrees to not demolishing the structure within an established kind of time frame um, and also establishes a process and next steps if the sale of the church doesn't move forward um, for this, you know, the city to kind of remain involved in the next steps for that property. We included the memo and the memorandum of understanding for you all to see just to review. So at this time, there is nothing, no other action for the commission to take on this, um, but just wanted you to all know what the kind of outcome was of the, all of that discussion. Well, our main concern was preventing demolition. So, um, again, it's like you said, it's the best we're going to do. 
looking at Suzanne. But oh, you're you, at me. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, no. So you always you kind of felt that we were overstepping in some ways, as I remember. Well, I certainly wanted the building preserved, yeah. and I stated that pretty clearly. But I did have concerns that we were setting ourselves up for <coughs> kind of getting kicked down, and and we did. But that's okay. I mean, you know, it, it was a process. So we've never done a, a landmark designation that was not not uh, with the cooperation of the app of the owner. Is that correct? Um, in the recent ones that we've done, we have not. Um, on in 2007, Calvary Baptist was designated a landmark, and that was initiated by Willa Johnson. And I don't have any record of whether that property owner, they, there's no paper record so, showing that they formally objected. I don't know what kind of informal conversations were had with them. There were, I have letters that were sent that have a, we're informing you that we're doing this tone, but I don't know what kinds of you know, phone calls were made and that sort of thing. Um, the four older landmarks that were done in the 80s, I have no idea what um, <laughs> what involvement there was from the owners. There were some comments made, you know, on social <laughs> media that the council action um, was a bad precedent, you know, counteract, countermanding the HP commission, but they have that authority. Oh, well, I, go ahead. The only thing I think is that I, if, we only have the authority to make an application. I mean, we're not, we don't have a final word in the situation. So I don't know what the big fear there is when we, yeah. we, we cannot make the final determination. Right. It seems like they should, you know, allow the Historic Preservation Commission to make recommendations. They don't have to follow through. We have no authority to make it final. Yeah. But in this case, it caused a good thing because there was more discussion and yeah. so forth. But, and they and found a buyer. I think part of the, some of the action might have been they found a buyer. What? Part of the result of the action right. might have been they found a, right. a willing buyer. So well, who knows? I've given this a lot of thought because you both have valid, valid points, but I, you know, there is a, you know, the city council has a final word on this, and I feel like the purview of the HP commission in this case was to, um, you know, to make a re recommendation of whether it's historic and whether it has value. And, you know, I felt like it did in that regard. And if there are larger issues that need to be decided, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, does the property right, does the owner have rights to that property that, you know, go beyond the HP commission, I feel like that's something that can be and sorted I, out in the city council. And I think and we, I, were, uh, we were right about taking that action. You know, we did our job, so. I think in other cases too, to I think speak they, on this side of other cities that when you start the action that and the owners kick up a fuss, that a lot of times it does end in some kind of, you know, uh, a, a compromise on both sides perhaps. You know, maybe you start something and they say, well, we don't want to do the whole thing like in this case. And so, I mean, it, I think that, you know, I, I agree. It, it starts a conversation that is important, and I, yeah. I feel like there was a lot of people in the preservation community that were interested in, and yeah. if, in us going forward to do something. It's, it's certainly created a lot of awareness about the property and all of that, and I think, I think to your point, it brought a buyer to the table. Good, I think good, it was good. Right. Yeah. I think we have somebody who wanted to speak about this. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Davis, 905 Northwest 41st Street. I'm a member of the Crown Heights, Edgemere Heights Neighborhood Association, and I am also our association's liaison to the HP Commission. So I appreciate you giving me a chance to speak sure. on this issue. And it more, it, for me, it's more a matter, I may be preaching to the choir, but I want this read into the record because there still are some feelings in our area about how this is all going down. And so I would just simply like to ask that the Commission, and this would extend to the City Council, honor the spirit of the historic preservation system, specifically as regards community input. Um, you know, there remains in our neighborhood uneasiness about what's going to happen over at First Christian Church. Uh, under the rules as they now exist, the neighborhood is, or at least is supposed to have a voice in the process. Um, I, I will tell you that I myself am personally very ambivalent uh, about this issue. I'm pro-preservation. Uh, but considering the experience we've had, for instance, with the Gold Dome, I'm also anti-white elephant. 
Um, you know, it, it, and it may be in the end that restoring this land to its previous vitality will require significant changes. Uh, quite often, in my experience, the best compromise is one with which nobody is entirely happy. Uh, but there, uh, those who have historically or traditionally had a voice, I think, should continue to have a voice. Um, I feel very strongly, and I offer this as a member, I offer this on behalf of the Neighborhood Association, that the Crown Heights, Edgemere Heights community is entitled to some say in this matter, more than it is received up to this point. Uh, to change the rules in the middle of the game, I think, does set a dangerous precedent. Um, I'd remind you guys, as if you needed reminding, uh, of what happened at the state capitol with the introduction of legislation in this session, which I understand is not going to advance, but legislation that would basically eviscerate the historic preservation district system in the state of Oklahoma. You know, if you allow the constituency in a particular situation, if you allow that constituency to be eliminated, where does it stop? Where does it end? Um, I respectfully ask that you remember why we're all here and what this is supposed to be about and resist any attempt to weaken the process out of, experience, out of expedience or in the interest of getting a deal done. Full transparency is of the utmost importance, and so is the safeguarding of the community's voice in the manner consistent with, with uh, traditional practice. And um, that's my piece, and I thank you for allowing me to take it. Well, Appreciate well said. It. <clears throat> my preference is, because uh, as you said, the council, uh, Joe said, had the final decision anyhow. I wish they'd let the process play out. Then everybody would have, would have been a report, everybody would have input, you know, and uh, the agreement that they made was to not demolish it anyhow, which was the effect of the, our vote was to, to stay demolition for 180 days or something. So I wish, I wish they would have let it play out so it could have been discussed. Well, I'm a little confused because when it played out, it's pretty clear there weren't going to be the votes on the council to, to approve, our, to, to approve um, the HP um, designation. And then we would have had nothing be, be, because the people who, vote, who were interested in buying the property and they had been talking about it for a year. Well, that could have been. The, so that, that was my, you know, obviously, then we would have had nothing. We would have had a buyer. So you're percent. saying that if they hadn't done what they did and let it play out, that they might have called the deal off. Mm -hmm. And I say, yep. It um, would have been, if the buyers, because it wouldn't have really affected them, I, I wish they also had, you know, let it play out, you know. I have to say one thing about the Gold Dome because people keep bringing up the Gold Dome. <laughs> the Gold Dome is not a landmark, and the Gold Dome no, has not been denied anything. Um, people, are that, people keep kind of suggesting that, well, you know, this historic preservation thing is what's keeping the Gold Dome sitting there like a vacant eyesore. The market is what's keeping that sitting there as a vacant eyesore, and they haven't been prevented from doing anything to that building at all. So, um, so that's not a good example. Just public pressure. <laughs> it's just been public pressure. I think there's, I yeah. think there's well, no, 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 not just you. You know, I think there are lots of things that prevent historic buildings from being rehabilitated and redeveloped, and it's not, sometimes it gets pinned on HP, and it's not always just HP. Well, <laughs> but, but, but I have a follow-up about the Gold Dome. I'm a the impression that it was under some kind of design review. Isn't there an, an uptown design? It is review? under it's the Urban Design Commission. Um, so they do have to get a certificate of approval from them similar to this process. Uh -huh. But at no point have they, well, decades ago, there was an application to tear it down to yeah. build either the Walgreens or the CVS. Um, but, you know, since that time, it has been Walgreens. redeveloped, rehabilitated, used historic tax credits, and had a successful run, and then has since had some extremely fortunate, unfortunate <laughs> <laughs> ownership scenarios. Um, and it's not just, I mean, I worked in that building. Liberty Bank owned it. That's not long ago. So, I mean, this is totally anecdotal, but it is a difficult building. Oh, yes. sure. And so it's not just market. It's not, I mean, that is a difficult building, and it has been since I sat in it, uh, sadly, sat in it about uh, 20 years ago or, or more. So uh, a lot of difficult buildings. It, I mean, a lot of people have tried, and a lot of people want to, and I, I think eventually it'll, like a lot of things that have, that we find a way to do, 
uh, somebody will figure it out. It just is a difficult challenge. Well, I think that there's a lot of value in uh, keep kind of keeping it simple architecturally. You know, uh, if you look at the buildings that get a lot of use now, I mean, they're the super simple, square brick, maybe with like the you know vaulted ceiling kind of warehouse type. I mean, those are so easy to redevelop. You can do whatever you want with those. You know, turn into office, restaurants, whatever. I don't understand why that hasn't been able to be done yeah. there, but anyhow. Okay, good discussion. Uh, onward. Let's see. We're not quite done yet. Let's see. So, no action um, on we that have information? A, sorry, we have a case that has been appealed that will go to Board of Adjustment um, June 20th. Uh, it was the parking cover in mm. Heritage Hills. Um, the neighborhood has already um, said that they anticipate attending the appeal. Um, I will actually not be here, but Lisa Cronister, my supervisor, who's the uh, manager for our division will attend the Board of Adjustment meeting and she and I will, she read those staff reports along the way and I kind of kept her on, informed on what was happening with that case, but we'll talk before it goes. Um, staff always attends just to be able to answer questions about procedure and clarification of things that are said in the staff report and the commission's actions and that sort of thing. Um, but that will be coming up. Uh, okay. Nothing to report from Planning Commission, nothing to report under ad hoc committee. Anything from you? No. Okay. All right. Uh, next meeting date, uh, the next regular scheduled meeting for the Stork Preservation Commission is July 3rd, 2019. I anticipate a lack of a quorum. At 2 p.m. at the Municipal Building, City Council Chamber. New applications for this meeting were received May 28th. New information on projects continued from today's meeting to the upcoming meeting must be submitted to staff by 4 p.m. Tuesday, June 11th. The next regular scheduled workshop, the Historic Preservation Commission, uh, is scheduled for Wednesday, June 12th, from 11:30 to 1:30 at 420 West. Oh, it's <laughs> 420th Suite 900 is canceled. <laughs> uh, yes, so I think Paula sent a cancellation, but I yeah. intended to follow up with everybody with the summer months and at the point that we had scheduled the. First Christian Church special special meeting, um, and then our July meeting. Uh, we just felt like it was packing too much in summer to a short number of weeks. Yeah. Um, I think a little bit later this summer we will be having a workshop to go over the preservation plan, which is like mm. this close to being done, um, and the content of that, and start starting that through the whole um, review process with presenting it to Planning Commission. We are working on getting briefings scheduled with council members individually to go over the contents of the plan with them, um, which is interesting timing with First Christian, but I think it starts a really good conversation, um, and we have a wide range of opinions on various topics, so, um, so we'll update you when we've got another date scheduled for that. Um, and I'm sorry that that might not have gotten out to everybody that we canceled that. Hopefully that's not um, no, holding I, off other things on your calendar. I forgot about it, but yeah. Um, on the that. anticipating the lack of a quorum, if you already know, or if in the next week or two or three you know that you will not be around July 3rd, please let us know as soon as possible, and we will um, figure out an alternate date for that meeting. I mean, hopefully that date works for everyone. We've adopted the calendar back in late 2018. But if you're not going to be available, please contact right. staff. Yep. Okay. How soon do we have to do notice of that if we have an alternate date? If we move it, yeah. Do we have to notice? That, don't we have to notice? It? Yeah. Two weeks? Or? Um, we have to, yeah, we have to post um, notice of the meeting itself 48 hours in 48 advance. Hours. But we don't have to. Well, we have to notice for the agenda items farther in advance than that. Okay, where I was really trying to get to is what's the absolute deadline that you need to know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I should um, ask that. We I mean, would, we, let me, let me look at a calendar. Um, we would be sending out public notice for the July 3rd meeting um, on about June 25th. June 24th, June 25th. So really, I mean, by the 
the week of June 17th, we would okay. want to know if people weren't going to be able to make it. You might send out a reminder if you, yeah. if, if you remember <laughs> to, to tell you. Okay. Uh, items from commissioners, anybody? Okay. The citizens would like to say something else? I'm done, okay. thanks. All right. So no, no more citizens be heard. If that's the case, there are no further business. We are adjourned. just everybody's on vacation? Is it because it went out so early? Okay. Honestly, I, 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 I miss the group. Yeah. I miss you guys. 